Hello there, and welcome to uh, today's ISTAT Learning Lab on the aircraft and engine asset-backed securitization or ABS market. It's our second in a series. Uh, my name is Peter Negline. I'm a member of the ISTAT Board of Directors based in Australia, uh, and I'm joined today by Niels Hallestrom, who's a former CEO of PKF Finance and now a director of the ISTAT Professional Development Program, or as we like to call it, the PDP course. Our presenters today are Evan Wallach and John Mowry. Now, before I introduce them, I'll provide their bios. Just allow me to mention that uh, Evan and John uh, provided for us last year an introduction uh, to the aircraft ABS market. Today, uh, a year later, they're gonna be moving on uh, to talk about the impact of the pandemic, uh, the Russian seizure of aircraft, the impact of higher interest rates uh, and also on recent uh, ABS market activity, uh, but also about the performance of existing uh, bonds uh, in the order of uh, some $50 billion of securities in the marketplace. Uh, they will also discuss the various activities and uh, uh, responses to uh, market developments from major participants uh, in, in the market, as well as uh, different stakeholders. Uh, now, just on, on their bios, uh, Evan uh, Wallach, uh, as I said, was uh, with us last year. Uh, he's the CEO and president of Global Air Finance Services, uh, which is an advisory firm uh, for in, my, prim, predominantly institutional clients uh, focused on uh, debt market activities uh, in the aviation industry. And that includes both aircraft engine leasing companies uh, and advising uh, issuers, uh, as well as traders and purchasers of, of those securities. Uh, John Murray is the Managing Director of Alton, uh, Alton, I should say, Aviation Consultancy. John brings more than 20 years of experience uh, to, the, to a global client base. He's worked for other prestigious firms, including SH&E at ICF, uh, and started his career with uh, General Electric. Uh, and now, I would just like to mention that uh, through the course of this um, uh, presentation, uh, we'll, we'll be listening to Evan and John, but you are very much encouraged to provide questions. Uh, and there is a, a button at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen uh, that will allow you to submit questions in advance. And um, uh, Niels will come back at the end of the presentation and run through and moderate uh, all of that Q&A session. So please don't be shy. Uh, this is a fantastic opportunity with two very seasoned, experienced uh, market professionals uh, to ask them uh, all the questions you want uh, to understand more and to better understand all the developments in the ABS market. So uh, why don't I leave things there and hand it over to Evan and John to present their views of the ABS market. We'd like to thank you for your time and look forward to your presentation. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, I think we're ready to go. Looks like this is the uh, presentation is up on the screen. Um, so we appreciate the opportunity. Uh, John and I are going to split up the uh, presentation into different sections. Um, and as Peter said, we're going to try to cover, uh, you know, both the broad uh, aviation markets, uh, the impact from, you know, the global pandemic, the Russian seizure, interest rates, fuel prices, uh, and then kind of narrow it down to um, our, our um comments on uh, how all this has been impacting both the pre-COVID issues uh, as well as how it's now impacting the ability to um, issue new aircraft ABS going forward. So John, turn it back to you. Great and thanks all for joining uh, today. It's a pleasure to be able to speak with you uh, once again. Um, as shared, I think what we're going to start out with is to try to put the ABS market into context of the overall aviation financing market trends. And so we have a couple of slides that hopefully set the context. What you see on the screen here is a chart that shows the total commercial aviation financing by channel over the last decade. And what you can see is if you total up the volume of issue of financing, it's been nearly one and a half trillion dollars over the last uh, decade, so very significant. On an annual basis, the market size trended up toward $150 billion in 2019, but then exp exploded in 2020 to nearly double that level, reaching $282 billion. This was of course following the onset of COVID and airline requirements for additional financing to sustain their businesses, particularly in 2020. And it was accompanied by a reduction in underlying interest rates as a result of governments seeking to stimulate the global economies and avoid catastrophic downturns. In 2021, it was the lessors who raised record amounts of financing, 
taking advantage of the favorable financing environment while also using the borrowing to support mergers and acquisitions and term outs of warehouse financings via the asset-backed securitization market, given the dearth of activity in the prior year. Overall, if we look at capital markets, which is shown in the bottom of the green bar, we see that it's taken on increased importance, increasing by a factor of 10 from 2011 to 2021, reaching $125 billion in 2021. Advancing to the next slide, this takes that uh, capital markets uh, and unpacks it a bit further. What we can see here over the last uh, decade of capital markets activity, airline and lessor unsecured bonds drove most of the volume, especially in 2019, 2020, and 2021. Airline double ETCs, lessor ABS, and other lessor and airline secured bonds have been important, but they've been substantially smaller parts of the market. Putting ABS into the context of the overall capital markets, we see that in any given year, ABS hasn't exceeded more than 10% of the total financing, and has had a tendency to fluctuate significantly from year to year. While ABS has accounted for less than 10% of the total aviation capital markets activity, we would postulate that it has had in recent years an increasingly uh, significance and importance to the market overall. The chart on the screen compares the volume of aircraft ABS issuances from lessors to the volume of aircraft that were acquired secondhand in the market by lessors. Nearly all of those aircraft that are traded in the secondary market by lessors are coming with leases attached to airlines from other lessors. While correlation is not causality, over the last five years, it's clear that the volume of ABS activity relative to the volume of secondary acquisitions of aircraft by lessors is increased, reaching nearly 60% in 2021. A fundamental part of the large lessor business model has been to acquire new aircraft at low prices, season them for a few years on the balance sheet, and then trade out of them. When the large lessors trade out of the aircraft, they've had two main channels to do that. The first are what are called trade sales, and these are sales of aircraft in small or large portfolios to other lessors. Frequently, those other lessors acquired the aircraft using warehouse debt provided by banks as a short-term financing vehicle, and then ultimately termed out the, the short-term financing with longer-term financing, frequently through the ABS capital markets. The other channel for lessors to trade out of aircraft included a direct sale to financial investors via asset-backed securitization and the issuance of e-notes directly. Given the more limited activity in today's new issuance market for aircraft ABS, which we'll discuss <laughs> later, later, we can anticipate some challenges in, uh, in trading volumes in the, year, in the next uh, year or so. Evan, let me turn it over to you then just for a quick review of the ABS structure and how they work. Okay, thank you. Thanks, John. Um, just, just to give uh, some context as well, um, I think it's good, good to just step back and look at what are the macro um, influences that we have on the aircraft ABS sector. So in, in the macro environment, of course, we've had the impact of COVID uh, and the global pandemic, you know, on global travel um, and on aircraft financing and aircraft leasing. And that, of course, has trickled down to the aircraft ABS market. If you look at the asset performance as another factor, uh, the price of fuel is having a major impact on uh, the demand for different aircraft types of, and different ages of, of aircraft. Um, if you go to looking at the servicers performance, um, you know, we've now had some good history of how servicers have been able to remarket aircraft, repossess aircraft and reconfigure aircraft um, in managing the, uh, the aircraft ABS portfolios. And also we can now look closely at the counterparty performance. What have, what, what's been the impact of all this on the lessees and their financial strength and weakness? And how have they been able to perform and survive, if you will, um, with the macro uh, economic trends hitting that? So if we go to the next page, um, again, this is just, you know, what is an aircraft ABS? It's a portfolio of aircraft with attached leases that's expected to generate a series of cash inflows and cash outflows. 
the, the representative inflows are going to be the lease rental revenue, the maintenance cash inflows, um, end of lease payments, and the outflows are going to be reimbursements for maintenance events, uh, lessor top-up contributions if those have been acquired as a result of the creation of the aircraft ABS uh, trust, and uh, any end of lease payments that have to be made. There's going to be transition costs, you know, throughout the course of an, a typical aircraft ABS, you know, 50% of the portfolio is turning over within the first three to four years. Um, there's going to be sales proceeds coming in uh, as services to determine whether it's an optimal time to sell aircraft. Um, they may be, you know, selling aircraft and reducing and li liquidating the portfolio slowly. And of course, there's going to be servicing expenses from the servicer and administrative costs as well. And um, on the admin cost, just, just as a quick point, you know, as, you know, uh, uh, as more and more of the management of the portfolio is required, that's going to increase the administrative costs per, per year for each of the portfolios. So if you look at the chart on, uh, as depicted, you can see that most of the cash flows coming in are in the first, you know, years one through six um, from, uh, for, for lease revenue and uh, maintenance inflows and outflows. The bulk of the aircraft sales are typically expected to come in year seven, uh, when either the aircraft is, uh, when the portfolio is either sold outright or there's a large refinancing uh, of the portfolio. So if we go to the next page, we wanted to just recap uh, something we talked about last year on the introduction uh, to aircraft ABS. The, the, the waterfall, understanding the waterfall is really critical. Um, this is a picture of uh, how, the, how the net cash flows are distributed through the waterfall um, each month. And, uh, you know, they're pretty, it's pretty generic across all, all aircraft ABS issues. So at the top of, of the waterfall, you have your required expenses. These are the operating and admin expenses for the trustee, for the servicer, um, any kind of consulting fees that have to be paid. They come off the top. The next level is interest payments to the A's and the B's. So uh, typically these are, you know, these are, these are covered even if there's a reduction in rent and a reduction in, in utilization. Um, so the A's and B interest can be covered. Next level will be the liquidity facility. If it had been drawn to cover shortfalls, uh, this is something we might see much, much later in the, in the life of the trust. Um, after that, we have to replenish the senior maintenance reserve account based on the projection for um, upcoming maintenance expenses over the next year. And then following that, we can now start paying down principal. So first level of principal is Schedule A principal, second level is Schedule B principal. And these are based on roughly a 12 to 13 year straight line amortization of, of, the, um, of, the, of the bonds. Uh, after that, if there's a, a, a need to put more money into the maintenance account, we can put that in. And then as you go down through the waterfall, until there's any kind of problem, you're now gonna get down to where you're gonna pay interest to the C's, principal to the C's, and also equity, uh, uh, payment to the equity. So the, the only point is keep this in mind, up until you know, pre-COVID, all the, the, the expected cash flows were coming in uh, at a level which, which did pay down through the waterfall down to, down to the uh, to the E-notes. Go to the next page. Uh, so, Based on the financing structure and asset cash generation performance, uh, the various debt and equity payments and balance profiles are expected. So you can see from this picture that in the first six years, you're really looking at paying down the uh, interest to the A, uh, uh, B and C, as well as principal to the A, B and C. If there's a tiny sliver left, it'll go to the equity. The equity is primarily looking to the uh, to, to the sale in year seven or the refinancing in year seven to, to recover the bulk of its investment and its return on investment. So again, this is this would be the typical picture depiction of what would what is expected in a in a typical aircraft ABS issuance and frankly had been on track uh, according to this profile um, up until uh, COVID and the pandemic hit in January of 2020. So I'll pass it back to John. Thanks, Evan. Let's turn back to characterize the broader aviation industry market environment because the performance of these ABS issuances are of course highly dependent on that market environment. 
it won't come as a surprise to anyone that's listening into this call that the broader market has been challenging over the last couple of years. The COVID spike caused passenger air traffic to fall by more than 90% in the second quarter of 2020. While we've seen substantial global recovery, the industry is still 37% off from 2019 on an air traffic demand basis. Domestic markets are performing better than our long haul international markets. On a regional basis, as you can see in the chart on the left, the Americas, both North, Latin and South America have led the recovery. And while the Asia Pacific region is still more than 60% lower than pre-COVID traffic levels. Shifting to the chart on the right, we can see on the fleet side that the parked fleet increased to more than 65% of the total fleet. And what's curious is that while aircraft of all ages were initially impacted in a similar manner, as time continued, the level of fleet reactivation by airlines was shown to be highly correlated with age. With a requirement for fewer aircraft, airlines generally chose younger aircraft uh, to come out first, and that, that continued to be the preference to this day. Given the sharp fall off in air traffic, it similarly won't be a surprise that aircraft values and lease rates have been impacted. This slide shows lease rates based on published third-party appraisal data for current generation narrow-body and wide-body aircraft. Collectively, the aircraft types shown on this screen constitute approximately two-thirds of the aircraft that have featured in ABS transactions since 2015. At the top, we have the current generation uh, Airbus A320 and uh, Boeing 737-800. And at the bottom, we have the two representative wide bodies, the 330-300 and the 777-300ER. Trends are shown for constant age aircraft of 0, 5, and 10 years old. If we look at the top left, for example, the A320, we see that published lease rates for brand new aircraft declined from, from the low 300,000s by more than 33%. According to the appraiser data, lease rates for the 10-year-old aircraft declined, but not nearly as much. What we saw was that placement lease rate compression during the downturn impacted the youngest aircraft most significantly. And that's a trend that's seen across all these aircraft types. We also see a noticeable difference between the performance of these current generation narrow body aircraft and the current generation wide body aircraft, with the wide body aircraft lease rates declining by more than 50% compared to the narrow body lease rates closer to one third. We also see that there's some improvement shown in 22 published lease rates for the used narrow body aircraft, but less improvement shown for the wide body aircraft and we're not yet back to pre-COVID levels for any of the aircraft. While the market lease rates fell significantly during COVID, it's not the case that the leases immediately reset given the long-term nature of the contracts in place. On this next slide, we seek to characterize the impact on cash flows that were experienced by lessors and the ABS vehicles. The top chart outlines the rental profile that might have been expected before COVID for an eight to nine year old narrow body aircraft with several years of lease term remaining. Following the scheduled expiration at 12 years, a couple months of downtime between leases, the aircraft might have been anticipated to rent for north of $200,000 a month for a certain five or six year term and then a lower rate. But as a result of COVID, many airlines had significantly less revenue and they were not positioned to continue making rental payments as contracted. For certain airlines, lessors agreed to rent deferrals and extensions, which is shown in the middle chart on the slide. A typical scheme was to permit certain airlines to make for a limited period of time, lower rental payments that were more aligned with their revenues. These lower rent payments were in some instances fixed and in other instances, they were variable based on the airlines flying, what we call a power by the hour structure. And in some cases, those power by the hour structures had certain minimums that might change over time. The lessor's willingness to agree to this interim relief was frequently conditioned on preserving the economics for the lessor. And they did that frequently by extending the lease term as is shown here in the chart in the middle. However, some airlines were not capable of having a viable business at all and so lessors had to repossess the aircraft 
incurring an extended period of time off lease before putting back the aircraft out to market at discounted rates, as highlighted on this slide, frequently with power by the hour elements associated. This type of outcome had the potential to significantly impact cash flows, but also importantly, the economics, considering rent uh, alone, but also missing end of lease payments, uh, as well as higher transition costs. To what extent lessors face each type of situation is quite difficult to characterize, but we know that the financial performance of all passenger airlines was severely impacted by the COVID, in, by the COVID situation. The chart on the left highlights trends in reported financial ratings for a universe of more than 100 airlines. These are not to be confused with formal credit ratings, but from the financial ratings, we can see that the double B plus and the double B financial ratings of the pre-pandemic airline universe has given way to triple C and single B financial ratings for the vast majority of the airlines in this universe. In the chart on the right, we can look at the exposure of ABS deals issued since 2015 to airlines that are known to have restructured either in court or out of court. And it seems to constitute an average of 15 to 20% of the pre-COVID portfolios. In addition, the chart shows those credits in the ABS portfolios that have been impacted by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So we're including lessees in Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus from this chart, which is also meaningful at somewhere around 5% of the ABS uh, portfolios. While these are averages for deals issued in each year shown, of course, individual deals will vary quite widely in terms of exposure both to Russia and to the restructuring. Evan, back to you in terms of the impact that these uh, this macro environment has had on some of the performance of the pre-COVID uh, issuances. Uh, yeah, thanks, John. So what we wanted to depict uh, in this section is so taking some generic um, issues from 2018, 2019, and looking at what's been the impact of the reduced cash flows from lower lease rates, lower utilization, reduced aircraft sales, what's been the impact on the um, uh, repayment of each of the each of the different debt buckets with, within the aircraft ABS structure? And as we saw in the in the waterfall depiction, uh, pre-COVID, you know, we had the waterfall buckets, and we were going pretty much with the collections that were coming in, we were able to cover each month, um, pay downs through the waterfall down, down to, in most cases, down to the E-notes. But what we're seeing, what we wanted to, 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 to show in, in these charts is that if, if you look at where we were in December of 2019 on these four generic issues, um, pretty much uh, the, the, the uh, rent collections were pretty much on track. Um, we, we then had to uh, in December of 2020, there was a huge reduction in, in rent collections. And you can see what that impact has been. And then in 2021, uh, we did have an increase in some of the deals, either through uh, being able to get, get money paid back from the lessees or not. And so there was some, some improvement in rent collections. But now it looks like we're going back the other way again. So um, if you, we looked at some of the July remits. And you can see that the, the rent and maintenance collections, you know, are back down to, you know, 40 to 50 percent of where they were uh, during, during pre-COVID. So if you go to, to the chart on the right, we can see what the impact has been on the debt service coverage ratios. So the DSCR was a new metric that was put in to the um, uh, last issuance uh, of, of, of bonds, you know, beginning in 2014. And it was a pretty effective, I think, a pretty effective metric to look at. Um, you can see that in December of uh, 2019, uh, the remits were showing that the DSCR for these generic deals were way above what, what the um, uh, trigger point was, which is 1.15, or 1.20. Um, and so basically, this is the metric of saying that cash coming in is all on track. If you look at December of 2020, you can see we're already trying uh, breaking through that uh, that that trigger point. We've got a couple of deals that are below one uh, one that, that that's still being able to cover uh, the, uh, the the cash flow service. But then if you go to 
the uh, December 2021 timeframe, now you can see that we're really all down below the trigger point. And that's when the trigger point results in then a, 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 an early uh, amortization or rapid amortization of, um, of the cash flows. And it looks like as of July, it's continuing to get worse. So um, as John had pointed out in, in, uh, in the previous section, I mean, the rental rates on the midlife and older aircraft really have not snapped back uh, at all to where they were pre-COVID. And this is being reflected in the, in the, in, uh, the debt service covered ratios that uh, we're seeing in, in the remits. And again, these are, these are pictures from uh, four of the 2018, 2019 issues. Okay, go to the next one. So you can see, uh, you know, generally pre-COVID issues uh, have been unable to pay principal as scheduled due to lower collections. And these are leading to shortfalls, especially for the junior tranches. So again, looking at those same issues, um, the chart on the left is a depiction of where the A-tronch a balances are. Uh, the green is the actual and the, the light blue is the scheduled. And so you can see that, again, the trend is clearly going negative from December of 2019 pre-COVID, where actual and expected were pretty much in line with each other. So that gap is now widening. Um, and as you look to July of 2022, uh, you can see that the trend line is definitely going, you know, neg negative with respect to the shortfall of the pay down of uh, 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 the A balance versus the, ex the expected. And again, it, it, it looks like a smaller a number, but don't forget the A, the a balance, uh, the A tranche is the largest balance. So even a small amount of shortfall is going to have a pretty big impact, um, you know, on the, uh, on the outstanding. If you look at the B tranche, uh, again, it's uh, even, uh, the, the trend is even more uh, uh, worse. So uh, the Bs in the last 24 months or so, they've received their interest as per the waterfall, but very, very little principal has trickled down to uh, repay the, the B principal. So in many cases, the uh, as you can see, the green line is pretty much flat on what the outstanding is for the actual. And the schedule, you know, again, over four each year was supposed to be paid down lower and lower um, till we get to a certain number in year seven. Unfortunately, it looks like this is just not happening because there's just uh, no uh, such a the shortfall of cash just is continuing from uh, Jana 2020. And if you then go to the chart on the right, the C tranche, um, obviously the C tranche is the worst because the C's of not, the, the interest of the C's is way down in the bottom of the waterfall. So the C's have not been getting interest or principal. And as a result, the, the interest owed to the C's is now picking. So it's being added to the principal balance of the, uh, uh, of, of the issue. And so that's why you're seeing the green line is an increase in the outstanding uh, unpaid balance of the C's relative to the expected, which is the light blue, which is supposed to have been, been paid down, uh, you know, each, each, each payment. So general picture, unfortunately, is that we have a situation where the overall amount of debt outstanding on the issues, which is supposed to be paid down to be able to do a refi or a sale in year seven, uh, is really stuck right now, you know, uh, in, at, at this level and um, looks like, uh, you know, could stay at this level for the foreseeable future. Okay. So I think that the rating agencies are picking up on, you know, on all these uh, trends. And as you can see, there's been, you know, some significant downgrading of issues um, during the, uh, for, for this, this is reflective of the 2019 issues. The average uh, downgrade for the A's is about two and a half notches. Uh, for the B's, slightly more, 2.6 or so. And for the C's, it's almost six notches down, downgraded. So I think that John made the point um, on one of his charts, you know, we, we started out typically with, um, you know, the series A being investment grade, single A. So that's now getting closer to the um, investment grade, non-investment grade border. Um, still investment grade for the most part, but getting closer to going over and some have gone over to non-investment grade on the A's. Almost all the Bs have gone from triple B or triple B plus down to double B or single B. So they've crossed over into non-investment grade. 
and this has a big impact on the capital charges for the uh, for the for the note holders um, who were expecting to you know be owning an investment grade bond. Unfortunately for the C's, you know, which mostly came out at a single B rating, they're now down to triple C or you know or double double C rating. So clearly down in the junk area, and I think justifiably so based on what we saw on the previous chart where there's been absolutely no pay down on C's and in fact you know an increase in the in the C balances because of the, the pick mechanism okay next um, so on top of COVID on top of uh, the Russian seizure of aircraft and that impact now we're getting hit with a big jump in, in interest rates um, from where we were uh, back in 2019 2020 so the chart on the right, on the left is the historical trend um, of, inter, of of the of interest rates. Taking you know the last couple of years on the right, um, you can see that you know it's kind of in the 2018-19 time frame. You know we were around on you know 150 basis points, 160 basis points in general as our base rate for for A issuance. Um, we got the benefit of the Fed's action in 20, where it dropped down to you know 50 basis points. And that's what led to this, I think, you know, a huge, you know, issuance of new bonds in 2020. I mean, the numbers really worked, you know, you had very, very low base rates and plus the spreads um, gave the issuers an ability to issue um, a lot of new aircraft ABS bonds in that time frame. But now we're jumping up 300 basis points from there and we're up to, you know, base rates of, of 3%. Um, you know, so when you go, you know, from 3% from, from 50 bips to three, you know, that's a huge increase in the, in the cost of capital. So the one issue, which we did see, uh, issued in 2022, uh, reflected this. So the A tranche came out at, I think it was like six, six and a half percent, um, versus, you know, the majority of, of A tranches pre COVID or even in 2020, you know, which were in the three to four percent price range. So, I think what we saw in twenty twenty two was that because of the much higher increase in base rates, the cost of capital for a new issue structure is now very, very, very high. And so, you know, it it, it probably is you know putting the brakes on new issues, as I've heard from you know many of the bankers, until we can now until we can bring in portfolios on the revenue side which have increased lease rates and higher, higher revenue to basically offset the increase in, um, in the higher cost of capital for, uh, for, the, for the base rates. So that, that's kind of where we are right now. And you know, we'll, we'll see how, you know, how this progresses going forward, but that's kind of where, where we're stuck at the moment. Okay. Um, so th this is being reflected in some of the secondary trading that, that we're seeing. Um, you know, as a result of, you know, the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the increase in the base rates or increase in, uh, you know, the, the Atron issuance this year, uh, that's probably accounting for 10 basis, 10 basis points of reduction in, uh, what the return requirement is now for the older deals. So we're seeing a tranches for, um, uh, this is mostly 2018, 19, 17 deals. Uh, trading, the A's are now trading, you know, we're in the high 80s, now we're starting to see the trending down into the mid 80s. And again, we think, you know, that that's reflective of both the job, you know, the increase in interest rates, but it's also reflective in like the, in the continued um, lower cash flows that are that are coming in and the lower debt repayments, the balances that, that are coming in as well. And I'm gonna, little, little editorial comment, commentary here from me. Uh, I think this is one of the, one of the uh, weaknesses in our, in our uh, market because we don't, have, uh, uh, we don't have good data for the current uh, uh, reflection or the current status of, of, of portfolios. And so without good data, without knowing what the leases rates are or the terms or what the deferrals have been, you know, or the specific, it becomes very, very difficult, even for investors that own the bonds, you know, who are getting the remits, to create uh, cash flow models, which reflect what the forecast, what the what the, what the forecasting uh, cash flows are going to be for, for their bonds, and so I think it's it's kind of hurting the secondary trading capability. Uh, it's hurting the ability to bring in new investors. 
Um, so it requires a lot of uh, sophisticated modeling, a lot of guesswork to do it, and it can be done. But I think if there was more, uh, if there was somehow, if we were able to provide more specific uh, granular data to, to the market and to investors, um, I think we could, we could create much better, air, uh, much better secondary trading, much better price discovery, much more transparency, you know, to create a really a much broader secondary trading market, which is really reflective, which would mirror what we see in other asset classes. Um, uh, and it does help investors with liquidity. And frankly, it does help issuers with price discovery as well. So uh, that's, we'll talk about this a little bit later. I think that that's it on this section, John. Yeah, thanks, Evan. I'll jump back in just to um, follow on some of the discussion around the different dynamics of issuances in different environments. Um, and we're sort of shifting gears a bit toward the post-COVID issuance market uh, from Evan's analysis previously of all of the pre-COVID issuances and how those are performing. And so we think it's important to highlight um, that there were a very significant volume of deals that closed in 2021, reaching 14 in number. But in 2022, you can see from one entry at the bottom of the, of the table, there has only been a single issuance that closed. So clearly something has changed. In 2021, we see that a number of the issuances are what we would consider to be core aircraft. Those deals closed by Sky, Mercs, Airlease would largely have been composed of aircraft that were acquired during the pandemic through sale leasebacks with strong credits. These transactions achieved all time low pricing on the Series A notes of around 2.4 to 2.5%. But we'll continue to make some observations about these core aircraft securitizations. We'd also draw attention to the diversity of the issuances in 2021. In the regional space, Falco closed on its inaugural issuance with a single tranche of debt featuring a low LTV, but a higher coupon. There were two engine leasing deals that were closed, one by the leading engine lessor Willis Lease and another by an entity called Thrust that included a portfolio of spare engines serviced by GCAS. Castle Lake, for its part, closed a refinancing of its 2017 ABS issuance, and it was received very well in the market, given a simple average portfolio age of nearly 18 years. So a huge amount of diversity uh, in the 2021 market. But clearly, 21, 22 has been a very different story. When the year started, there was a significant amount of optimism for the ABS market to continue, given the very strong finish in Q4 of last year when six deals closed. While a number of transactions were in the works, the Russian invasion of Ukraine caused a pause in issuance. And since then, uh, interest, with rising inflation, interest rates have also gone up and it's made the economics less viable for issuers or less attractive. Advancing to this next slide, we compare the issuances in three very different market environments over a relatively short period of time. The first environment shown on the left of these charts are the pre-COVID deals issued in 2019 and 2020. The second environment are the 2021 deals, which were issued post-COVID. Uh, and then the third is the single uh, issuance here in 2022 year to date. Perhaps the most significant change you can see is in the top left where we're showing the coupons of the A notes. Pre-COVID, uh, the deals were priced around on average, you know, three and three quarter percent. Notwithstanding the pandemic and the elevated risk to the airline industry as a result of COVID, the quantitative easing by central banks drove record low coupons for the 2021 deals. But as you can see, the coupons have more than have doubled uh, here in the 2022 issuance to six percent on a coupon. Uh, and with the pricing, it was yielding around six and a half percent at issuance. Not all of the lower pricing in 2021 was a result of quantitative easing. And we can see that from the chart at the bottom left. The credit quality of the airlines that were less eased in the deals improved. The 2019 deals, as you can see on the left, included a significant portion of aircraft that were leased to airlines that were not rated. And those are generally airlines of lower credit quality. You can compare that to the dark blue lines, which show the universe, the volume of deals that included unrated airlines were substantially lower. 
overall, the credit quality of the airlines in the deals improved substantially. If I continue counterclockwise at the bottom right, we can see that the simple average age of the aircraft has been surprisingly steady for these core aircraft deals at around nine years old. However, what's noticeable in the 2021 deals is that the lease term remaining was substantially longer by nearly two years. And this reflects the nature of the deals uh, that were uh, underwritten by many of the issuers, sale leasebacks, providing capital to creditworthy airlines on a long-term lease basis. Finally, at the top right, we can see that the LTVs fell only marginally in the 2021 deals, but the only transaction that priced here in 2022 did not include any junior tranches. So structurally, uh, some very different market environments. If we look pre-COVID, post-COVID 2021, and 2022, the market today. Evan? Yeah, uh, thanks, John. Um, picking up on you know the previous uh, information that John just gave, we wanted to show what the um, waterfall levels were by year of issuance. And so we came up with this great chart which shows on a year by year basis uh, it, what, the, what the average waterfall level has been for each of the issues. And so just looking at it, you can see you know, that uh, 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, the level uh, that we've gotten to on the reduced cash flows is really, really the, just the maintenance, of, uh, maintenance uh, bucket and um, the Series A principle. There's been a little bit of principal paid to the B, but but not really not a whole lot. And then if you look at the 2021 issues, um, the 2020 and 2021, we can see that the waterfalls uh, cash collections have actually gone down through the entire waterfall and gotten to the to the equity in the 2021 issues. And so John and I were talking about you know what's what is the basis behind this? What do we think is really causing it? And I think. One of the things which hasn't really got hadn't really gotten that much attention over the over the uh, issue over, over the last couple of years has been the credit quality of the lessees. We, we've looked at the servicers, we looked at the age of aircraft, we looked at the leases, but there was I, I think the, the credit quality of the lessee was always uh, less of, less of, deemed to be less important. And so, but I think what we're seeing now is that with COVID hitting and with um, you know, the, the, the uh, lessees coming in um, and requiring deferrals, requiring uh, reductions, the, the stronger credits, the stronger lessees have continued to make their lease payments. And as a result, those portfolios that have the bulk of stronger credit lessees have been performing much, much better than, those, than the majority of the portfolios, which were really geared towards emerging markets, credits, and, and older, older aircraft. And so one of the problems is that with the uh, weaker credits and the older aircraft, basically the lessors had very little leverage when those lessees came in and said, look, we, we, we can't make the payment you know, that, that's required. So we need a reduction, we need a deferral, we need something. Whereas on the newer portfolio uh, uh, of aircraft and the stronger lessees, um, it looks like most of those just continue to make their, their contracted uh, lease payments. So I think that going forward, what does this mean? I guess, you know, we'll, we'll see what the composition of portfolios look like going forward, but it looks like from, um, if again, we're, you know, we're, we're looking at where we are today, it looks like the, um, those portfolios with the weaker credits, um, which is a majority of the aircraft ABS issuances have performed the weakest. Um, in this unprecedented, um, you know, post post COVID environment. Okay, so we just wanted to kind of look at uh, what's been the impact on on the major constituents in the aircraft ABS world. The current bondholders were buying bonds that had a roughly, a, you know, on, uh, an A and a B had a five year um, average life and a seven year expected payoff. And that was that coincided with what we what we call the ARD anticipated refinancing date in year seven. Uh, however, with the actual higher uh, actual balances and therefore higher LTVs than expected, together with the higher interest rates, it, it looks like refinancing is now going to be prob problematic for for uh, for those issues. 
And bondholders now own bonds with an extended duration, uh, which is unknown and an unknown maturity and possibly a shortfall in the repayment of the par amount, um, which is impacting their, their investment profile. So, um, you know, it, it looks like it just, you know, we have to keep a close eye on, on, uh, on those items. On the current e-note holders, the e-notes, you know, have received little, if any, additional proceeds since the start of the global pandemic. And for the most part, you know, the bonds are behind in their scheduled amortization and unlikely to catch up. And therefore, the e-notes are, are even more unlikely to receive any additional proceeds. And if they do, um, the target return, I think that they were expecting, of, you know, mid-teens, is very, is very unlikely to be achieved. And so the question then for issuers um, is how, how does that impact the ability to issue new bonds going forward, new, new aircraft ABS structures going forward, if the old E-notes haven't gotten their return, then how, how are we gonna structure you know, the, the new bonds going forward so that the, the E-notes will be getting their expected return? Uh, the other impact, you know, a major constituents being impacted is going to be the warehouse lenders. Uh, you know, many, many of the uh, aircraft ABS issuances are done as a take to, to take out a warehouse facility that's been, that's been provided by the uh, underwriter. And unfortunately, you know, with the um, higher interest rates and as we've, you know, seen on the 2022 issue, uh, the numbers just don't seem to work right now. So, it looks like the warehouse providers are going to have to hold on to their um, their paper, and basically that short term facility is now going to turn into you know a longer term loan, and that that become that changes the economics you know of um, what the borrower is going to have to pay and what the capital charges are going to have are going to be for the for the warehouse lender. So it's going to have a pretty big impact on their willingness to, to do more in the future. Unless, unless there's some balance that they can achieve. And finally, for the aircraft lessors, um, you know, the aircraft ABS market has been a huge tool for portfolio management um, of their fleets. And this has primarily been in the midlife aircraft of their, of their portfolios. So, you know, they've been able to generate, you know, uh, gain on sale or sale treatment by creating an aircraft ABS through the e-note. So that there's, there's a real transfer of, you know, of title or sale to, to, um, to a new buyer. Without the ability to do that going forward, um, again, it's gonna have some impact on the lessors management of their, of their fleets. Um, they're gonna have to find alternatives to um, reduce their older aircraft uh, portfolios because that's having, that could have an impact on their credit rating based on the age of the, of the fleet. And so this could lead to, you know, a major uh, change in uh, pricing for, you know, for aircraft ABS bonds going forward. And um, again, a lot of uncertainty, you know, with how it's all impacting, you know, the major constituents um, of, the, uh, of the issue. Okay, back to John. Thanks, Evan. Yeah, and just to, to close out, if we take a step back, take a step back and move uh, beyond the core sort of ABS markets, um, you know, where are we in terms of the environment? You know, we're, we're confident that the, the worst of COVID is behind us uh, and there's still opportunity left to close that gap, the intrinsic demand of passengers to travel uh, and close that gap to pre-COVID levels still continues, especially in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, so hopefully we see that, uh, that, that market come back more significantly over the next year. However, the road to recovery uh, is gonna be challenged by the operating environment for airlines. Inflation is impacting labor costs for airlines together with fuel prices. And these are the two largest cost buckets for any airline. Geopolitical risks, as everyone knows, seem more present than ever. And economies around the world now are bracing for some softness, which will reduce the rate of traffic demand recovery that might have otherwise been. For the lessors, fortunately, we do see lease rates and sale leaseback transactions moving up quickly, largely to reflect the need to service higher debt costs not necessarily as a result of less competition in the space. We think that lease rates for used aircraft will continue to advance toward the pre-COVID levels. 
but this is going to take time and it's going to be driven by a recovery and the continued recovery in aircraft yeah. supply and demand balance. However, we do have some concerns around aircraft with long-term contracted leases that were underwritten previously. They may be impacted with uh, less rapid rise or recovery in values, given that the buyer's financing costs are rising. Overall, for the market, we don't want to lose sight of the fact that there will be additional opportunity for lessors and financiers in the years ahead. The delivery market is projected to reach $100 billion of aircraft in 2025, and we know that airlines aren't expected to be in a position to take all of these on balance sheet. We would put forward and suggest that those are lessors that can secure low-cost debt financing from any channel, ABS, uh, capital mar other capital market forms, or uh, bank lending channels are going to be those that can be most successful. I think with that, uh, Peter, we may turn it uh, back to you or to Niels, rather. Okay. That was uh, <coughs> interesting. Thank you so much, guys. And it was pretty exhaustive, too, because uh, to, right now I only have one question. And that is from uh, Dominic Wong. Is he with you, uh, John, uh, in Singapore? Uh, yeah, okay. I, I know Dominic, yeah, very great. Okay. Well, so, so he's uh, asking, uh, what will the drivers be that will push lease rates higher to pass on higher capital costs? So I think I'm happy to take a take a first cut. I think when, when I think about lease rates, you know, there are a couple of different markets and I don't think about sort of a, a single market lease rate. You know, there's a lease rate for transactions that get done in the sale leaseback market. And I think when I think about that market, it's lessors have the opportunity to price that deal at the time they're bidding on, on the aircraft. Uh, so when they decide what, Price to bid, they're going to be looking at that point in time. What are their what are their borrowing costs? And so, pretty quickly in that market, a lessor has optionality around to what level to do the deal at. And consequently, we think that the lease rates are. We know that the lease rates are picking up. They're advancing uh, in this current market because the debt costs are are increasing. On the other hand, for an aircraft that is already on the books of a lessor perhaps a used aircraft uh, or even a new aircraft that is coming down the delivery pipeline. In that market, we think that the lease rates that can be achieved are more a function of aircraft uh, supply and demand. And so in, in, in that instance, I think there's, you know, there, there's risk or exposure that the lessors have uh, to that supply and demand balance. And um, you know, I, I think fortunately we've started to see some improvement in the market from the depths of COVID. For sure, a lot of the deals that were done during COVID, they had some element of power by the hour um, components. You know, we, we're not seeing you know uh, lease placements today. You know, with power by the hour noses on them, uh, we've really moved into the fixed rates, and those fixed rates do seem to be advancing forward. Um, so, the, in, in the used the placement markets, newer used, it, it's really a function of supply and demand. And we seem to be on a on an improved trajectory. Evan, any? Comments from your side? Um, no, just, just uh, it, I guess, you know, like I, I agree with John, it, it's really going to be driven by more by, by supply and demand. What, what, we, what we may see, though, is maybe some kind of bifurcation based on age, um, you know, where the older aircraft uh, will continue to move down the food chain, you know, to, you know, the, the less, less the, weak, the weaker lessee credits. And you know, the newer midlife, you know, younger aircraft, um, you know, you know, moving to better credits, you know, might, might uh, uh, lessors may have a, an, an opportunity to negotiate higher rates, you know, with, with the better, with the better credits. So hard, to, hard, to, hard to tell, but, uh, you know, I think again, you know, with the slowdown and new deliveries coming, um, increase in gold in, in traffic, um, it, lo it looks like, you know, supply is, is going to be a little bit stronger. Uh, you know, so we could could see some higher interest rates, but yeah, I mean, right, we, it, right now the numbers just don't work. So you know, we definitely need to see that increase in revenue um, uh, on the collection side. But isn't that a little bit of wishful thinking as well? 
<laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess it is. But uh, you know, again, it's it's a global trend. We've seen you know aircraft leasing you know start out at a low level relative to the global fleet, and now it's it's critical you know critical driver you know for global traffic to, you know to to improve. Uh, so I guess if that trend continues. You know, then we we could see a, a you know a higher demand for aircraft across the board. Yeah, but that was uh, actually I had a couple of uh, technical questions. Um, there was a, a couple of slides sh showing simple age. I know all about complicated age, but what is simple age? Yeah, the, the simple age just means a, a simple straight average of the aircraft in the portfolio, rather than being weighted by book value or or book okay, value. okay, all right. Okay, thanks. But uh, there was one thing I, I was thinking about on uh, slide twenty three. You have the uh, the yield curve evolution over time, right? And it uh, looks like there is a, uh, a flattening of the yield curve going on now, uh, which is, has typically historically been a, a sign of a of an economic recession. So if that if that is hitting us now, it's not only higher interest rates, but it's actually that you know. Uh, GDP is going to grow slowly, which means there's going to be less traffic growth and to absorb the supply. Uh, that that looks a little worrying to me. I don't know if you agree with that. Yeah, I think for, for sure the inversion of the yield curve has historically been a signal that, uh, you know, the bond markets anticipate, you know, future challenges and, uh, you, know, you know, economic downturns or, or, or recessions. Um, I do believe it's the case, you know, it's not always been a 100% reliable predictor, but in, in a number of instances, uh, uh, you know, individuals do and, you know, do, it has been a good predictor. Um, so for sure, you know, th there are all, you know, you know, risks today to sort of the world economies do seem more significant, um, you know, than they have over the past uh, couple of years. Um, we were well supported by uh, lower interest rates from, uh, you know, go governments around the world to sustain the market. But it looks like perhaps that uh, capital was overdone and we're seeing rising inflation on energy, on labor. Um, and, and that's a real challenge that will pinch consumers. And so if they have, you know, an, an opportunity to, you know, if they'd had an opportunity to travel from Northern Europe to Spain for, for a holiday or vacation, and now their fuel bill, uh, you know, has gone up by, you know, 500%, you know, they may not have that same discretionary uh, amount of income. And, and that presents, presents real risk to, to the airlines yeah. uh, and, and our industry. Yeah. I think at the same time, you know, th there are always these, these mixed developments. We still have the broad opportunity to continue to recover from COVID in the Asia Pacific region, for example, where traffic today is still very, very low and it's been held down. If we can see, COVID moved to the rear, uh, rear view mirror in Asia, that has the potential, notwithstanding an economy, uh, you know, that's a bit softer to, to result in a very significant amount of increased, uh, you know, global demand. Yep. Um, so as is always the case, I think there are, you know, headwinds and tailwinds to, to, to what, you know, we'll experience. Yep. Um, Thomas has uh, posted a question. Uh, it was on the chat uh, group, but uh, please use the Q&A button to post questions. But anyway, the question is, do you expect to see ABS insolvencies? If so, when will that happen? Um, I got to take a shot at that. Um, so the, um, the default trigger in the aircraft ABS structure is uh, the, the, failure, the failure to pay interest to the A's. And so um, that could happen. Uh, you know, let, the previous wave of bonds that we issued were all floating rate. And so um, it really took a lot to uh, not have enough cash to come, you know, to, to pay interest on the A's. All the bonds that have been issued since in this last wave are really our fixed rate coupons. So, you know, three and a half, four percent. And at some point, if the A balances have not are not being paid down, and aircraft are being sold, um, or aircraft are being sold, and there's a, you know at lower levels, so aircraft so A balances are being paid down slower. 
you possibly could have a situation out and out in the future where the rent coming coming in with fewer aircraft is not is is after after required expenses is actually less than uh, what's needed to uh, service the um, you know the interest payment on the A's. The one thing which covers that is usually you have you have a liquidity facility of you know 10, 15 million, you know, which you can then draw against to cover you um, for that that interest payment and prevent a, a, a default of the uh, uh, of the structure. So it's 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 very difficult, but you know, as you're liquidating the portfolio, as you're selling airplanes, and if airplane values are lower than expected, and bond and and as a result, the uh, the A balance is not being paid down. It's very possible that you could you could have a scenario out you know out in the future where the um, there is a failure to pay interest uh, interest to the A's. Yeah, have you guys looked at uh, how the uh, uh, the loan to value ratios uh, uh, are evolving on some of the ABS issues? I mean, are we getting into dangerous territory there? Yeah, I think, you know, if, if I, I might just add on, to, add on to Evan's comment, you know, we've had the, the opportunity to, to look in depth with sort of full detail on behalf of different different constituents at some of the ABS issuances. And, you know, as we model out, it's, it's been hard for us to see where there will be a technical default, you know, without, you know, in, you know interest being paid to the A's. You know, our, our expectation is that, you know, there won't be technical defaults on, on, on most of the issuances um you know be, you know just just even even given the challenges um you know in the market i think what we will see you know is, is that there is there will you know t today i think there is a challenge as, as evan described before there was always this expectation of a refinancing on the 7 year anniversary of the issuance the the ard and in order to uh, be able to refinance you've got to have uh, proper loan to values for the portfolio Otherwise, it's, you know, your refinancing isn't going to be viable. And, you know, you can look at sort of the, um, you know, you can look at exactly, you know, we've seen the LTVs on the notes outstanding creep up, you know, very significantly. Oh, John? Uh, John, I think you're muted. Lost you there. <laughs> I think his headphones might have just disconnected. Yeah, okay. All right. You want it fairly on there, Evan? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I think uh, as John was saying, you know, the, the initial amortization profile is like a 13-year straight line amort for the A and for the B. And then the C is supposed to be paid off in full by year seven. So I think in the modeling of it at issuance, you're down to like 45% of each of the uh, A balance and the B balance. And frankly, I think when you when you modeled it out at, at that point, you know, the LTV at year seven, uh, if everything went right and aircraft values say where they were, was was probably going to be you know, 65, 70% for the you know for the A and and you know 70% for the B. So a, a refi would have been would would have been very likely. Um, if you look at today's values versus the increased versus the higher debt balances, um, I mean, unfortunately, yeah, you're 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 really you're I think at LTV levels, which make a new issue for the outstanding debt very very difficult. You know, because you're you're probably at 80, 90 percent. You know, for the uh, for for the A's. So it really means. So what, what what happens though? It means a very Unfortunately, this, you know, for investors, it's kind of a passive investment because what happens is that um, you go into rapid amortization mode for the uh, for the future until the A is, A gets everything until it's fully repaid. But that could be, you know, unknown. That the the duration of that extension is really is really unknown. So bondholders that thought they were buying a seven year piece of paper could end up with a, you know, much, much, much longer piece of piece of paper than they, than they thought. And yet they're continuing to get the same fixed rate coupon that they, that they bought. So the economics really get impacted um, when this extension take, you know, takes place. Yep. Uh, I think we have John back online. Yep. Yeah. I'm here. The sounds working great. Yep. Did you hear what Evan said? 
I've never disagreed with Evan in anything. He says. <laughs> anything to add? <laughs> I was continuing nope. your line of thought. <laughs> no, I think we're aligned on that. Thanks, Neil. This isn't the question, but it's a feedback from Will uh, Eustace. He's, he, he liked your presentation and he's asking if uh, the material would be available. And it, it will be on uh, in a couple of days on uh, istat.org under online content. And it will also be uh, on YouTube. So if you Google Evan and John, uh, ABS gurus, you will probably find <laughs> it there. Okay. Uh, now, you know, you're welcome to uh, post more questions, guys. Uh, in the meantime, I, I had a question. I was very surprised by a comment that I think you did, Evan, that it was hard to get data from the issuers that could be of use to the bondholders to assess their situation. Isn't there uh, a requirement under the, uh, the, the bond issue that, that the issuer will uh, keep the uh, uh, investors updated on the uh, status of the portfolio? Uh, yes, yes. So the monthly report that um, investors receive from from the bondholders, uh, from the, from the issuer, from the servicer, um, it, it is detailed. But um, it, it's how do I put this? It's not, in my opinion, uh, it's not sufficient. You know, to really do a forecast modeling, if you want to get down, if you want to do it on an individual aircraft level. Uh, you you receive a monthly report and it gives you the total rent and total maintenance reserves and aircraft sale proceeds. Uh, gives you a snapshot of the, of, of the portfolio, um, what the what the lease expiration dates are. But if you if you really are looking at you know a modeling out a, an aircraft ABS deal as if you were buying a portfolio of aircraft, then what's really needed is to know what the, what is, what are the new lease rates, you know, that are now in, in the deal, you know, that have changed because when the bonds are issued, you know, you have a stick, you know, have a set number of, of aircraft to set on, on lease, but by year three or four, those, those leases have turned over. And so now you have a much different profile of cash flows than you had when you issued, when you issued the bonds. And I think that what, what's, that, that this has just been multiply, mu multiplicatively exaggerated because of COVID, where not only do you have a change in interest rates, a change in lease rates, but you have deferrals, you have power by the hour. So it becomes a lot of guesswork for, even for an investor that owns the bonds, if they want to model out what the, what the future cash flows look like for each of the, each of the individual um, aircraft. And so the question that becomes for, for a new investor looking at the bond is what's the, what's, the, what's the real value? What's the fundamental price that I should be paying for these new, for these new cash flows of this, of this portfolio? And so we're seeing bonds like the A's trading, you know, 88, 86, some cases, you know, 75. But to me, the, the, there hasn't, there, there isn't any, there isn't any, like a, there isn't a fundamental modeling that investors agree with, agree on where they can, like they, like they have with mortgages and loans and credit cards, where you can, you know, you can agree on the model and then you can fight over the price. You know, in this case, what does 85 mean, you know, on a, you know, 2018 um, aircraft ABS portfolio? Um, maybe the val maybe the true value should be 55 you know, in order to get a decent return, you know, eight, nine, 9% 9 return. And also the return risk, I think the, because the risk is now higher, the return price, the return should be greater for that same portfolio. So anyway, my point is that if we, if we had some, some mechanism, you know, where there could be access to, um, to this kind of data, you know, which goes to the rating agencies and, you know, uh, and, and some other parties, um, then, you could have a bunch of people doing third parties doing this modeling, you know, which would I think really stimulate secondary trading, you know, better price price transparency, um, and result in a probably a broader a broader you know breadth of uh, of, of investors that that come into the space, and especially in a in a difficult time like this. In good times, nobody really cares. You know, everybody's getting getting scheduled payments, bonds are at par. But in times like this, where it's totally unknown, 
you know, what the, what the future cash flows are for a specific deal. I think it would really help everybody, you know, issuers to do new deals, investors liquid for liquidity. If there was more, you know, if there was an ability to, you know, to um, get the same data to, you know, every year or every, whatever that, you know, was provided at issuance. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, John, I, I had a question for you. Um, on your slide 17, you showed uh, examples of uh, rent development uh, year over year for different aircraft categories. But how did you account for power by the hour releases, uh, for example, or deferrals? Sure. So the slide 17 was really intended to just be, you know, an indicative uh, type of uh, economics, just to outline at a high level what a lessor or a structure would have anticipated in terms of contract rent and a standard, you know, releasing rent. And then we effectively just, you know, for purposes of this um, presentation, just looked at, you know, how do we haircut, you know, in, in the case where there's just a, a, a deferral and an extension, we looked at a, a reasonable reset from the current rates to what we perceived to be then market values for the aircraft layered on a step up uh, back to, to the return and then ultimately extended the rent at the original uh, lease rental level for a period of term that would make the NPV of those rent cash flows uh, neutral. So we were just trying to demonstrate what does the rent and extension terms need to be to provide that near-term relief to the airline, but still to make the airline uh, airline whole. Um, okay. So okay. each each individual circumstance, you know, of course, would have been unique to to the negotiation between between the airline and the lessors. Um, have Have you noticed any? Uh difference in appetite from the investors for uh, exposure to Chinese carriers in ABS issues? Okay. I mean, candidly, since, you know, since the beginning, I mean, for, since the beginning of, um, you know, following the invasion of Ukraine, you know, by Russia, you know, there's really only been, um, you know, one issuance that has come, uh, you know, to, to market. Um, but, but I think there is, you know, for certain investors, you know, there's a perception that, you know, geopolitical risks have, have increased and there's uh, for sure a desire to um, stay away from, you know, credits that might be impacted, uh, you know, in the future, you know, down the road. Uh, so, so for sure that's, you know, impacted. I, I don't think we can say, you know, or I haven't been able to discern the, on the issuances that have already, um, you know, are already out there in the market. I can't perceive if, um, you know, there's been, you know, different pricing or, or, or interest in, um, you know, depending on the level of uh, exposure to, to Chinese airlines. But Evan, would you have any perspective on that? Uh, yeah, no, I, I was just going to switch it a little bit. Um, you know, Niels, when you and I got into this business, I think that the question we always had in credit committee was, um, you know, how do you, how do you get your plane, you know, out of a jurisdiction? You know, because we would make the case, you know, well, don't worry about the credit. We can always get the plane out, you know, and, and bring it someplace else. I think I think the Russia seizure is a game changer, in my opinion, because um, I think that that, it, we, you know, in the last 20 years, the guys that have come into the business and women have come that have come into the business. They could always answer that question with don't worry about it. You know, there's precedent everywhere, even in Russia, you know, that if there's a bankruptcy, you can get your you can get your plane out. Well, I think that now that they go, you know, guys are going to go into committee and they're going to have to answer that question and you, they won't be able to say, well, it can never happen. And I think there's going to have to be a lot more focus on, you know, the jurisdiction, lessee credit. And frankly, China might, I think, you know, might have a little bit of that over, over you know, uh, flow of, of, of negative perception from Russia. Well, you know, if it happened in Russia, couldn't it happen in China? Um, I don't think so, but, um, you know, different environment, different need for aircraft, et cetera. But I, again, I think that, you know, the, uh, the, the bigger picture from a credit standpoint um, and a risk asset risk standpoint, I think it has, uh, has changed because of, uh, because of the Russian seizure, hmm. especially, you know, there's no, you know, we haven't seen how insurance is going to play out. Um, so we just, we just don't know. I mean, there may be a new, you know, need for, re, you know, um, expropriation insurance now for certain jurisdictions that we haven't had had to have previously. 
Yep. So if the ABS market is, uh, is, is challenging at the moment, I mean, where do you see the financing coming from? Are the OEMs and the ex export credit agencies going to have to step up? Uh, well, I'll just take a quick shot. I mean, I, I, think, I think the private market is going to be much more attractive to the lessors because I think in the private market, there, there'll be much more of like a creation of, of, a, of a portfolio for that finance, for that financial party um, versus, you know, the, the public, public market and creation of ABS in the public market. So, you know, I think, I think we'll see, we'll gravitate. I think we'll see a gra gravitation towards the private market to, to pick up some of the slack. Um, and again, you're, you're going to trade off liquidity. You know, if it's under the private market, you know, you won't, it won't be, it won't be as liquid, you know, I mean, one of the, one of the uh, trade-offs in the public market is the perception of liquidity for you, for your paper. Um, so I think that, you know, John, I don't know about you, but that, I mean, I think that's one, one area that's going to pick up the slack. Yeah, no, I would agree w w with that. And I think, I'd, you know, the, again, you know, caveat the abs market was you know 10 percent at best of the capital markets for the industry and you know a smaller part of you know the overall financing industry considering um you know loans as well um but i think you know what, what i think it creates opportunity you know for additional investors there are bank lenders out there who are attracted you know to the space and we've had conversations with some of them that are looking at it and saying you know, uh, the natural financing in, you know, 2019 and then 2021 for a lot of these, you know, portfolios was capital markets, you know, is there opportunity for us as we grow our lending books to provide capital, you know, to the industry on a term financing basis, um, you know, where, where ABS, you know, was most active. So, you know, look, I think, I think the, the financial markets are, um, you know, reasonably efficient and, you know, uh, where there's opportunity you know, there's still lots of capital out there, you know, where there's opportunity, uh, different uh, channels will turn on or, or, or turn off or become, you know, more active. I don't think we'll have a situation where, you know, that we'll, ha we'll have a shortage of, of, of capital, you know, to finance new deliveries where, you know, OEMs and, and ECAs, you know, step in. I think there's still a lot of capital out there. It's just, it's just going to be a little bit more expensive. Yeah. And, and have you seen similar challenges in the unsecured, uh, uh, bond issues by the source. Yeah, I mean it's 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 fallen you know back you know very significantly. Twenty twenty one you know was a very strong strong year, mm -hmm. and you know here you know what we see today is you know in the secondary market yields for sort of you know tier one you know lessors are you know unsecured you know five five and a half percent you know which is a game changer. Um, you know, relative to what it was uh, last year. So, so for, for sure, you know, uh, the impact of, of higher interest rates is going to, you know, carry out, you know, and continue throughout the whole sort of aviation leasing and financing space. And so repricing that the whole, the whole market will have to deal with. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that the, uh, the inflation is going to be a little bit of a savior to the leasing industry in terms of maybe helping their value retention on, on aircraft in nominal terms? You know, I think it's easy. It's easy to sort of compare and contrast and say, okay, if we were in a you know two percent inflationary environment and now we're in a five percent inflationary environment, you know, add three percent you know to my <laughs> residual values and you know happy days. Um, we've done a pretty significant sort of series of uh, statistical modeling around it and looked at all of the factors that influence value retention and what we saw was that there were a lot of you can, other economic factors that were correlated with inflation rate. Um, and so we didn't see, you know, as strong of a relationship on aircraft residual values uh, as a result of inflation because of all those other factors that are impacting economics as I think many in the market might, uh, might anticipate. There is some impact and it's, uh, you know, you know there, there are some positive indicators, but it's not a one-to-one -one uh, impact on aircraft residual values for, from the analysis that we've done. All right. Okay. Uh, well, guys, I think this was very interesting. Uh, you didn't ask so many questions uh, now, uh, you in the audience, uh, but I guess that's because you covered this, uh, you know, all the base. 
So thank you so much for that. And uh, we will have more learning labs. Uh, just check in on istat.org uh, for future learning labs. And then I hope to see some of you in Marrakesh uh, uh, on, on Sunday night. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Thanks, Niels. Thank you, Niels. Thanks to all. Thank you.